Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report and our special panel, John Moore, who has his own show from 7 to 9 a.m., Monday to Friday, Central Standard Time on the Republic Radio. Uh, the website is thelibertyman.com. Our scientist, Ann Morrison, at homeland-defense4u.com. Uh, and uh, lots of updates. So, John, tell us the latest what's going on and what are you trying to verify and uh, what is the breaking news? Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Bill. Good to be here. Um, well, we're working on a follow-up with uh, a number of private sources on the status of Russian troops coming into the United States. I hope to have some uh, interviews uh, from uh, eyewitnesses this coming week on my show. And uh, a couple of stories we're following up on. I, I don't like to go public until I have uh, corroboration, but um, some stories that are, are very concerning, if they turn out to be true, that uh, if we do get corroboration, we'll certainly go public with them. Yeah. And bottom line, uh, the Russians are here. They're, they are arriving in, in greater numbers. Uh, that's, a, that's a well-established fact at this point in time. Uh, there's conflicting stories as to why they're here. Their mission statement, uh, none of which are good. Um, and we just continue to tra- track these stories and uh, be ready to respond in, in whatever appropriate manner we need to. Yeah, exactly. The, the first question you'd ask is, number one, what are the numbers? We know, I knew that back even in the mid-90s, there were a lot of uh, Russians and other former CIS, uh, Soviet nations, uh, uh, people being trained in our weapons and tactics. They weren't just left here. Some of them were actually not just here for a period of time. Some of them actually were literally given long-term, uh, if you want to call it, ability to stay in the country <clears throat> uh, under pseudo jobs, basically just waiting as sleepers, sleeper agents. Uh, we actually had sleeper cells that we identified in Colorado when I was working there, and I had uh, people that were inside the intelligence service that actually identified their locations, and we even visited some of them <laughs> and saw, hey, look, these guys are Russian. What are they doing here? They're in Littleton, Colorado, or they're in... Greenwood Village or whatever. It was crazy. Uh, that's the first thing. So it's real. It's been going on a long time. And at any one time, there could be anywhere from half a million to 1.2 million foreign soldiers from nations all over the world, from Canada and Brazil, being trained in weapons and tactics. And I'm thinking, why would we do that? Unless we're either going to invite them in here at some point to suppress the American population, uh, or we're going to sell them our equipment so that they can use their, our equipment to suppress their own populations. Because this is basically a form of civil defense suppression type of thing. It's not a foreign invasion force. These forces are specifically designed to deal with, with uh, civilian battle uh, in uh, U.S. cities and rural areas. Absolutely. And I, don't, I believe you pretty... Uh explicitly gave the two choices i'm not aware of a third choice yeah so yes uh, yeah i think that is, yeah the other thing is a story that we've been following which and i mentioned about a month ago when we started following the story about the approach of nibiru the death star uh we call it the uh the, the Passover star. The fact is, we know it is coming in. The multiple sources have kind of uh, tried to, to to kind of push the envelope that it's, that it's coming in sooner than expected. Um, we know the government are doing what we call logistic game ops. Uh, I don't believe that things are happening now, but we are going to get some reports from uh, Anne in a moment on sinkholes and Christina Consolo. There are some earth changes occurring and some releases of gases, including radon and other gases that aren't coming from Fukushima that are highly radioactive being released from the bowels of the earth all over the planet. Uh, so there's planetary changes occurring. Um, I think the government basically knows something's going to happen and they don't have a- accurate enough data so they just want to have everything logistically in place but we're not talking about decades we're talking about years away or months away from something cataclysmic whether it's the new madrid system fault line breaking which is very likely because there's a tremendous increase in activity or the uh, san andreas faults which we've had major activity on over the last few years and we're due for another uh, earthquake like the 1995 earthquake in california uh, the fault extension in Mexico is not called the same name, but it's the same darn fault system. So, and maybe you can kind of uh, talk to talk about that in the sinkholes. What's going on there? <clears throat> well, we're having sinkholes across the country, but the most uh, the most alarming one are occurring in the uh, subsidence area of Louisiana, of coastal Louisiana. You got an uh, amazing report. Tell us about it because that's when I heard what you said, and of course I cross-checked it with Christina Consolo and other sources. You got some important news here. Tell us. Yeah, this um, this sinkhole. Uh, 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 well, <laughs> it uh, they had been noting uh, earthquakes, and uh, and the uh, USGS scientists. Uh, 
you know, he, he just thought that it was noise, so he just kind of ignored the fact that people were complaining about earthquakes. And then uh, he finally finally got wised up, and uh, he discovered that the earthquakes they were feeling were in the noise, and that's why he hadn't, hadn't, hadn't uh, registered them. So they're very small earthquakes, and they were not they were not seismic earthquakes. What they were was um, earth slippage, and so um, and we know that the coastal area of Louisiana is uh, subsiding, that is sinking, and uh, so uh, these earthquakes went on for about a month, and then suddenly they stopped, and the next day a huge sinkhole appeared, and this. Uh, sinkhole was in the middle of a, an area where people, where oil companies had been drilling down into a salt dome. Now, a salt dome is a protrusion of salt up into the, up into the uh, soil or into the ground. And what oil companies do is they drill down and they drill into the salt and they make a cavern and then they use that to hold uh, butane or radioactive materials or uh, methane. And in this, in any case, the sinkhole occurred very close to a um, to a, uh, uh, a a well in a, in the salt dome that was holding butane. Now, th- there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, butane and oil and you know everything transferred from Oklahoma and t- and Texas into uh, Louisiana, and so it, you know, there's a lot of pipes in the ground. And one of the, the sinkhole just kept growing bigger and bigger. And finally, on August uh, two weeks ago, Governor Jindal declared a state of emergency for Assumption Parish. And at that time, the sinkhole was 372 feet in diameter. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a big <laughs> deal. That's a big deal. And uh, he ordered a, an evacuation, a mandatory uh, uh, evacuation, and and. Uh, then last week on Thursday, the Department of Homeland Security collected uh, next of kin data from the residents who disobeyed the mandatory evacuation. And uh, then uh, they decided that they brought in workers uh, because, it, you know, if we've got pipes going through a sinkhole, they bend because they're not being supported underneath. And the sinkhole was exposing some piping that was carrying butane and, and oil and gas and methane. And they didn't want those pipes to bend to the point that they would break and um, let the let their product escape because that would have been a uh, well that could have created a uh, well you, you a, know how dangerous butane is I mean it, you mentioned how bad the explosion would be and how many people would die if this thing uh, you know within ten miles they get third degree burns uh, that you mentioned to me before the show. Uh, subsidence, of course, this is similar to Aceh, Indonesia. There's a process called specific gravity. And when you pump in water or seawater, in place of oil, you pump out underneath these tectonic plates. Remember now, the tectonic plates are floating on an ocean of abiotic oil. This is not brontosaurus. This is not ancient ferns and plants that are being turned into oil. This is ancient abiotic oil created by the nuclear reactor called the planet Earth. Earth is a nuclear reactor with a crust on it which we live on, with a thin blue line of air around it and a magnetic field that prevents us from dying from cosmic background radiation, radiation uh, ga- gamma rays, and zeta particles that zip through our body and, and, and neutrinos. So uh, <laughs> when you actually think of it, it's amazing we're actually alive, isn't it? Um, well, yeah. In any case, what they were doing, uh, they uh, they finally called in DHS, that's at the federal level, and... Uh, they started making the workers wear respirators, and uh, they told Texas Brine, which was the one who had been shipping in the, the butane and storing it in Louisiana in the salt domes, uh, what they want them to do is to drill down a, a relief well. In other words, they want to draw, uh, drill down a well and then see if the, if the salt dome is still intact or if it's got cracks in it. Because if it has cracks in it, then the butane could start, start escaping. And if the butane escapes, it'll turn into a gas, and uh, it's being likened to a hydrogen bomb. Oh, boy. Not a pleasant uh, situation at all. Welcome back, and um, we had a good time to go over the preparedness list. I'm going to do a major written update on the uh, 10 plus 10 plus 10 list. Those uh, bands, by the way, that, you, that were mentioned on the show, and 
the um, UV bands, I think, are a good idea, you know, where people have a band they could put on their wrist. Because one of the best ways to measure whether or not uh, we're really heading into some tough times is that we're going to get uh, lots of solar radiation. And you mentioned on one of the previous shows that July 12th, we had a CME that had pulsing ultraviolet light. So during the day, people weren't getting just regular light. They were getting blasted with very high levels of ultraviolet light caused by this uh, coronal mass ejection. And it was pulsing or, or the, the Earth with this UV light. Uh, the ozone layer com- combination thinning and the magnetosphere thinning combined with uh, increased solar activity makes it very variable and very dangerous at times and also very likely to destroy crops. So uh, besides the drought, the increased space weather problems are going to increase the chances of crop failure. And anybody into commodities that's listening to this program should know that they're the way to invest in the next uh, few years is going to be commodities. Any comments? Um, yeah. yeah, actually, the uh, the UV pulse wasn't associated with the CME. The CME came in two days later. Oh, okay, uh, was, it just a, was it just the sun strobing, or what happened? Well, they haven't said exactly. They said that they, there was a strobing of the Earth by a very concentrated UV uh, ultraviolet light, and that uh, it came through, apparently, through the um, ozone hole that's over Greenland, and um, uh, probably is responsible for the ice melt that occurred on Greenland. I know they haven't published any more pictures, but I haven't yeah. looked for any either. Yeah. By the way, a UV and light uh, transforms to calls deep cracks and ice much better than, than infrared light. UV light is very bad for... The reason why the poles are melting is because of higher ultraviolet light coming in and boiling from below with increased under-oceanic volcanism like the Gakkal Range, which is a 1,500 mile volcanic mountain range that's as high as the Swiss Alps. So when people try to think of global warming, we're having extremes of weather now, right? But the general trend is uh, is going to, number one, harm crops. Number two, we're heading into an increased rainfall. And even if it got warmer, the rainfall is the thing in the northern latitudes that will drive us into an ice age, which is where we're headed. Well, that's right. It, it has to do with the amount of water that's in the air, and we're getting more evaporation out of the ocean because the ocean is spreading out, and so we have a higher area from which to evaporate. And in addition, the ocean is getting warmer, and so when it's warmer, then it evaporates more water vapor out of it in order to yeah, maintain yeah. its, its it, temperature. It's so heating from below, a, I guess, right? Um, yeah. Well, no, they're not saying that so much. They're, well, that depends on whether you believe in global warming uh, or the greenhouse effect, one or the other. But it is getting warmer. They know yeah. that. And you can look on the Navy maps and see the climate change on there. They, yeah. I mean, they, they show a dramatic increase in temperature up in the northern, uh, well, above 45 degrees latitude in the northern half of the uh, northern hemisphere. What about the all these sinkholes? Um, they're all over the world now. What do you think is going on? Well, and you know, and probably different things at different places. But uh, I'm very concerned about these sinkholes that are down by Louisiana. You know, we had the Macondo well uh, drilled into the methane class rate cavern, and we're still leaking methane class rates out of there. We're we're building up a big bubble of methane. Uh, underneath the Gulf of Mexico, five miles down. And I understand there's a 20-story high um, methane bubble off the coast of San Diego. Now, the oil companies, they want to mine the natural gas, the methane class rates. They want to do it to the point that they're doing it even without permission. In other words, they send down their oil wells, and and uh, if they just happen to uh, punch into a methane cavern, uh, well, golly, we've got methane. Let's uh, let's uh, bottle that and sell it as natural gas. Um, so, and all the oil companies are looking to go from oil to uh, natural gas. They think it burns. Which is clear. primarily meth. Primarily methane, isn't it? Um, primarily methane, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, I mean, there's going to be contaminants in it, and um, some of those will be radioactive contaminants, and there'll be. Uh, but they go through a refining process, and uh, you know they add an odorant so that you can tell when you when you're around it, and uh, then they pipe it into our homes. But they, re- I mean, they're looking in the middle of the country. They're they're looking off the coast of California, and they're looking, uh, of course, in the Gulf of Mexico. 
So really what they, they're not looking so much for oil now. Now they want to go to natural gas because it has a better PR factor. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So they're, they're, they're living on the edge. And unfortunately, these things where, um, where we're getting these sinkholes is exposing, um, is exposing, uh, well, it could expose some of those caverns. You know, the, the methane is kept under very high pressure in these caverns. The methane is, is uh, at such high pressure that it associates water with the methane. So there might be 20 water molecules attached to a single methane molecule in a cavern. And then as it, when it comes out through a migration channel, and in fact, they've, in some of the uh, reports that have, been, that have been published on this thing in Louisiana, on the sinkhole in Louisiana, are saying, oh, maybe it's a migration channel. You know, it's not, it's not because we were drilling there. It's just that methane uh, migrates out of its cavern, and, and uh, it, it, uh, you know, all of a sudden we've got a methane problem. Uh, anyway, where the land is subsiding, and it's subsiding both along the coast of uh, the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana, and Texas, and it's also subsiding off the, the uh, southern coast of California, it's down around San Diego. And that's probably due to the oil companies drilling the wells and sucking out the oil and potentially uh, tapping into some of the uh, methane caverns or the butane caverns caverns or whatever they've got so uh this is not a good sign on either co uh, either on the gulf of mexico or in southern california yeah exactly uh, in fact there's actually a a large deposit of oil and oil class rates off of the pendleton marine corps base and uh, they estimate somewhere around 15 to 30 billion barrels of oil just off that coast in one deposit uh what they're doing though is they're pumping out oil and putting down salt water which is a different specific gravity so it's not surprising they're getting subsidence in louisiana coast um john one of the things i want to kind of revisit here and i'd like you to get your response to this because a lot of people think that when we're going through the process that we call journalistically vetting things we don't make a pronouncement that you know on a certain date or whatever something's going to happen we say this is our sources of information i'd like you to clarify that because a lot of people don't realize this is a process that's ongoing and uh, it, uh, yeah can, can you tell us uh, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 what a journalist does and, and by definition all of us are journalists and, re, and I, i'm doing the work of an investigative journalist um, we uh, get information and we uh, check it out to the best of our ability to verify that it's accurate, and then we have the responsibility to report that information and be the messenger. Uh, and sometimes we're put into a quandary where the information has a, a strong likelihood of being true, but we can't verify it is. So if we withhold the information and it turns out to be true, uh, people could get hurt because we did not report it. Right. If we go ahead and report it and it turns out to be inaccurate, then we end up with egg on our face because uh, nothing happened. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And, uh, John, you had a couple of interesting things. Just while we were on break, you had a call. Yeah, and during the break. Them. And this might be helpful for everybody, Dr. Bill. I've been a radio talk show host since 1995. I've developed uh, working relationships with other talk show hosts around the country, uh, which uh, served a good purpose all these years just for doing radio talk shows. But now that same... Uh, men and women that I've worked with all these uh, 16, 17 years, we've become what's, what might be referred to as a private intelligence network. And we've, we're networking, we're discussing, we're talking about what's going on. The call I just got two, three minutes ago was absolutely frenzied in, in terms of the sense of urgency that the event is near, that the Russians are here to help us out in our time of need, allegedly, uh, during this transition period after the flyby of Nibiru. Uh, and that uh, further confirmation that uh, U.S. Northcom will be basically be our new government for some period of time, U.S. Northern Command, and that uh, Denver will be our new national uh, our, uh, capital for the foreseeable future, beginning very soon. 
Uh, well, we know that the CIA directorship is moved from Langley, Virginia, to Aurora, Colorado. Isn't it kind of uh, strange that uh, Mr. Holmes also uh, resided when he was going to school in Aurora, Colorado? Kind well, of strange, I'm not sure it? what the connection is there, but uh, I just it know it's strange. a geographic connection. I'm not going to bring it any further than that. But uh, we know the government's preparing. They probably know more than they're going to say, and they don't want to quote, panic the public. And whether or not it's going to be in two months or six months or two years, they're getting ready. And they're getting ready based on solid science. they got the Chandra X-ray telescope. they got IRAS. they got the stereo telescopes looking at the sun and solar objects in space. A red dwarf class 3 star can only be seen with an X-ray telescope or infrared. You can't see with a regular light telescope, uh, even with uh, the Hubble. You're not going to see it. You have to use these other types of telescopes. It has a, a moderate gravitonic effect, but because it's a red dwarf class 3, it has an incredibly powerful magnetic field. So I'm sure that there's, like the magnetic uh, uh, array of uh, satellites that the Japanese put up three years ago, they probably can see this strange geomagnetic dipole coming into our solar system that will probably trigger off some major solar storms, and the likelihood that that's going to knock out power in the northern hemisphere as I said in other shows, is virtually 90% in the next two years, somewhere in the northern hemisphere, and possibly southern, we're going to have some major blackouts. And, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Well, at the very least. And then, of course, I know, remember I, I now when notes, they, I'm sure you and Ann both, both get notes, people thinking they're walking out in their backyard and looking at the 10th planet. Uh, <laughs> but, but for all the reasons you state, that's not possible. No, it's not possible. But what's going to happen is that this astronomer from uh, from Brazil, very senior astronomy for the National Academy down there, has seen it. There are doctor, there are people that are leaking information from the South Pole Telescope. There's an international consortium of countries that are doing their the Arecibo Telescope in Chile, which is run by the Vatican. They all know that this is happening. This star actually is the same star they call the Satan star, Herakidabus, the same star that returned at the time of the exodus of the Hebrews that destroyed, triggered off there the super explosion in the eastern Mediterranean that destroyed the Minoans and caused this fall of the second uh, kingdom of the ancient Egyptians. So, uh, you know, these are cyclical events, and uh, it's coming back. Okay, right. that's and well, we, we can't and, see, and we can see it coming back. And the fact that these scientists probably have an idea based on velocity, uh, trajectory, etc., when they expect to have its maximum gravitational and or plasma effects on the sun. Absolutely. Well, Doctor Phil, I've been at this twelve years now since uh, the spring of two thousand, and it's been about the last three years. I came to understand the, the, the true nature of human beings occupying this planet and the cycles human beings go through coming up out of the mud where they've been smashed down by the 10th planet and almost wiped out uh, about every third cycle, reaching whatever level of uh, culture, civilization, uh, engineering, science they reach, only to get smacked down all over again. Right. In yeah, fact, it's uh, roughly three cycles ago when, and I was told this when I went to the U.S. Space Command, that the Black Knight satellite, which is put in polar orbit, which we only achieved in the, in the last, uh, I think, five to ten years, to put uh, satellites in polar, polar orbit, this satellite is over 22,000 miles just inside the Van Allen radiation belt and larger than the U.S. Space Station. And I was told, and they asked me, how many, how many years do you think that's been up there? And I said, I don't know. And they said, it's been up there between 12 and 35,000 years. I never heard that. I heard twelve thousand years from my sources. I never heard yeah. that larger number. Yeah, they said. They said it was. It's a lot. It's twelve thousand plus. They said twelve thousand. Well, that, that, that's a fair estimate. Right. In other yeah. words, it's been up there. Human civilization has risen and fallen, just like the ancient pictures of Imana and other craft. Uh, human human beings. Just think of it this way: in a little over a hundred years, human beings have gone from the Wright brothers to interstellar travel, and our real space programs are far more advanced than people will admit. Uh, you know, the fact is that we are incredibly inventive. We are literally creating the image of the Creator God. And it says in the Bible, now they are in one place and of one tongue. We are now with the Internet. Nothing will be restrained or, or withheld well, from know, our Dr. imaginations. Bill, gaining access to the contents of the Black Knight satellite could have advanced our technology by two or three centuries easily. Yeah, exactly. But I know that the technology that we have in space is far more advanced. In fact, one of the first things they told me at Space Command, uh, July 10, 1994, when I was at, went to Shriver Air Force Base, uh, east of Colorado Springs, is they said that our 95% uh, of our space technology is aimed out in space to nearest objects. So the nearest object uh, program, parts of our program for asteroids, comets, and uh, things like you know, perturbations of our magnetic flux fields and interstellar uh, radiation like uh, gamma bursts, etc., we are intently putting 
trillions, not billions, trillions of dollars into these projects because we know uh, that and we need to have more open what are called discussions with Russia and other countries because we can't just go it on our own and say, uh, you know, this is part of the reason why they have all these black op projects. Their money's going crazy. That's right. So, uh, Christine, I want you to get into this stuff about uh, about Earth changes, because it will all tie in with this, because we know that the Earth is starting to change. We're getting release of radiation everywhere. We're seeing sinkholes, not just off Louisiana, where they've evacuated populations near this salt dome that they they drilled in and put butane there from a Texas company. But we've got things happening everywhere. What's going on? Uh, well, I, I started noticing the sinkhole events, um, not only those, but water main breaks and train derailments that have been occurring with uh, alarming frequency. We had four separate train derailments in North Carolina in the last two weeks. Uh, we've had a, a number of sinkholes around the New York area, in Brooklyn, Bensonhurst, uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and 12 of them along a, a stretch of beach in New Jersey. And the New York City planners that have finally uh, gotten to the pipes underground and were saying that they thought it was from infrastructure. We're saying that the pipes are fine, even though they're 100 years old. They're not showing signs of corrosion. They're just breaking um, as if the, the ground is moving. Now, right, which, I, which makes sense that there's a subsidence occurring. And all the groaning in the earth, we're hearing all these weird sounds in the air, but we're also hearing groaning sounds coming out of the earth, Yeah, I think, in Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin. You hear all these kind of strange sounds coming right out of the ground. And, you know, that's still going on, and I see people post frequently about that on my page. Just a few nights ago, it was happening in New York again. And I mapped these out in, uh, on Google Maps and, and saw most of what's happening as uh, extending from Louisiana over to Florida and then all the way up the coast to New Hampshire. And it's also happening along the St. Lawrence Seaway and into southern Ontario. And yeah, by, by the way, right down in the center of the St. Lawrence Seaway is a giant fault line. Exactly, and I pay attention to that fault because it points right at Fermi 2, which is a reactor that sits on Lake Erie. Um, and I and I want to go over that re- the reactor list too because the mainstream news is only reporting four events right now. There's actually 18 that are going on. But 18 nuclear um, events meaning like with power outages or other issues going on, right? Well, we we've got six plants right now in hot shutdown, and three of them that are reporting large tritium detections in their groundwater. So right, so in other words, they're major, not, just not minor venting, but major tritium leaks, right? Major leaks. Nine Mile Point in New York, um, Surrey in Virginia, and River Bend in Louisiana is, is detecting 432,000 picocuries per liter. Right, so we're not just dealing with Fukushima, we're dealing with radiation release from the ground, and our reactors are losing containment and releasing not only tritium, but very on the verge of major problems, and also where the water levels drop, a lot of these places are not going to be able to keep their, their reactors cooled because they have to have that water level, otherwise they'll not be able to do maintain cooling of the core. Yeah, we have a few of those right now, too. Yeah, amazing. Continued in one moment with Christina Consolo, John Moore, and Ann Morrison. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. I don't want to be driving under those damn things. And They're going to come down real fast. Welcome back, and... Um, you had a number of interesting requests, uh, Christina. Tell us about them because this is significant that uh, you had whistleblowers at uh, a number of places that want to release information. Number one, have they conveyed any information yet or are they just threatening to to be a whistleblower? Um, well, I, I, I don't know exactly what their, their motivations are. Uh, but have they conveyed any information? That's the question. In other words, they, we don't we don't need to get into their mind. We need to know: Do they say something, and can we corroborate it with either scientific logic or any other source of information? Like uh, Lawrence Livermore, you had a contact, and you also had a botanist that wanted to contact you regarding genetics. Right, and, and some of the plant mutations that we've been finding, and, and that people are posting, and we just have hundreds of images. By the way, the best way to tell, and I mentioned this, I was on the break. 
because uh, I did my research on genetic and radiation toxicology back when I was working uh, on my PhD project in 73, is what's called uh, genetic anisotropy, where you basically uh, get heteroptopic chunks of DNA stuck in other chromosomes. So you do a scanning electron microscopy of a plant or an animal with a scraping, even a scraping of the inside of your mouth or a plant cell. If you look at, and you can literally count these under the scanning EM, if you get a high score, it means besides micronuclei, these chunks of DNA that are uh, stuck to the wrong chromosome that are hanging off them like fruit, that tells you uh, how big the radiation damage is. And because of short lifespan, animals like butterflies that are being damaged very badly and songbirds in, in, uh, in Japan, the same damage has happened to the unborn, which are 100 billion times more sensitive here in North America, and particularly in Japan. And those levels of anisotropic uh, DNA uh, damage are going to start showing up with more micronuclei, more chunks of DNA in the wrong chromosome, and we're going to start seeing a much higher rates of trisomy 13, 18, and 21. The only survivable one pretty well is trisomy 21, except for Bella, uh, Rick Santorum's daughter, that had a trisomy 18, which is a miracle. She survived as long as she did. But this is a, a literally an extinction-level event. And the problem is the regular media doesn't want to cover it. We know there are real scientists that want to whistleblow. So tell us what they're saying. Well, we need access to, you know, sophisticated equipment so we can test uh, some of these plants. And I'm encouraging people not only, at, you know, after they photograph it or, or do a video, put it, put it on YouTube, put mutations in the title, and then take uh, samples and dry them out so um, we can uh, provide research. So we need hard data, and, and we're not going to know the extent of contamination until we get those numbers or until a full-scale soil survey is done of the entire United States and Canada. That's the only way we're going to know, and it's probably not going to come from the USGS. But in following, you know, what's going on with these numbers, we've been seeing some really high grab sites over the past couple of weeks, and I started looking at the earthquake list and compared them to where we've had some of these measurements. Just for example, on August 10th in Charleston, West Virginia, we had 450 CPMs. That was measured on the EPA monitors, Next day, we had a 2.5 uh, magnitude earthquake there. Raleigh, North Carolina, we had over a thousand CPMs on June 16th. On June 20th, we had a 2.0 there. Um, Omaha, Nebraska, same thing, 460 CPM. Uh, two days later, we had a 2.7, and I've got about 20 of these correlations. So I'm, I'm sending them to some geologists too to get their opinion on whether the limestone, um, some of the sinkhole events, if there's enough uranium content in limestone, I don't know if Ann knows the answer to that, that would be bumping up these levels. This is really high, even though we've had high numbers in Fukushima. Yeah, a lot of places don't know it because... It's going on at the plant, unless there's something really dire that's going on there that we don't know about. Yeah, so in other words, there could be two, three sources. Number one, most likely is this coming from the ground or the plant. Uh, we know that these are probably not Fukushima, believe it or not. Even though we're looking for Fukushima, it's strange that we had Fukushima to kind of give us a heads up. So we start looking for radiation, but it's coming from the ground underneath us. Right. Or it's coming from releases from plants that we have around us. In the majority right, and these plants have been releasing all along. We know that they've had all kinds of events, but they just don't they cover it up. When I was working in 1987-88 in Georgia, we had the Savannah River plant. There was two plants, the Hanford plant and the Savannah River plant to make the plutonium detonators for our warheads. The main one now that makes the plant detonators is the Savannah River plant, which also makes all the MOX-2 reactor pellets that the uh, senators tried to sell got <laughs> Grassley and so we tried to sell to the 25 Mark 1 reactors, uh, uh, GE reactors, and convert them from regular to what's called hot plutonium MOX-1 reactors, believe it or not. All those pellets came from the Savannah River plant, and the year before I started, they had a major event release, and that radiation apparently was so bad uh, that the uh, vehicles that got contaminated, they actually dug a hole in the parking lot, they were too radioactive to move, and dropped all the vehicles into the hole and covered it up and concrete capped it. So they told us not to worry. We had radiation suits. We had everything because we were just a few miles away in Augusta, Georgia, from the Savannah River plant because we were the closest large facility with a trauma and burn unit. And uh, that we would have, they had radiation detectors and they were going to fully support it, no problem. But don't damn well talk to the media or you're dead. D E A D, dead. Oh, so these events you. happen all the time. Savannah River is like ground zero for bad stuff happening in America because it makes the most dangerous radioactive material on the planet. 
Susquehanna, Pennsylvania, this week there was a transfer trailer that had uh, very high cesium-137 contamination. They haven't uh, determined how it got on the trailer or what they're going to do with that truck. It's interesting that you would measure the, the view. Well, right. mention well that. We, I remember I was the incident doctor with Dr. Uh, John Hughes who was a reserve admiral in the, and he had a contract with Rocky Mountain and Rocky Flats back in 1997 and we had one incident where a liquid radioactive waste trailer coming uh, uh, coming up the I-70 slid off the uh, black ice in the middle of winter and they had to pull it off so it didn't end up in the Colorado River with radio liquid radioisotopes because it had, it had it would have made the entire southwest U.S. radioactive with plutonium and other nasty isotopes that would kill most living things down water and they managed to get the thing back up, but there was nothing in the news. Everybody was warned, you talk, you're dead. And we're not just talking about getting fired, we're talking about dead. Even without the earth changes going on, um, which are very alarming when you consider how many new plants we have in the same area that all these things are occurring and how many are having problems right now. I mean, you imagine... Yeah, that's a lot of problems. Here. So, John, John, what do you think of all these uh, issues happening? Literally, with you know, I've got this gut feeling that the next big two areas of quakes are number one, New Madrid; number two, the uh, San Andreas fault system. And I would put a three to one risk higher that it's going to be New Madrid. And there's 25 Mark One type reactors uh, and other reactors sitting right within strike zone of the New Madrid fault system. What do you think will happen? Well, they're both at risk, and uh, New Madrid seismic zone is the potentially the most powerful and most deadly on the planet and uh, it, there's pipelines going uh, from Texas to the northeast right over the new matter seismic zone all the nuclear plants you're talking about the Mississippi Valley with all the bridges and the river uh, a couple of good-sized cities St. Louis and Memphis at great risk so there's a lot of potential for great harm from well, anything uh, happening on well, the new one matter. thing I've, I've shared on previous uh, shows uh, probably a year or so ago is I had one of these standing visions a number of years ago where it was after the earth changes had happened and I took a car ferry across the then the Midwest waterway and it took uh, a number of hours to cross it right so in other words whenever the earth is going to change believe it or not it's the it's the is the like a zipper opening for the center of the United States there's going to be a waterway eventually open between the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico and it's going to go right through this uh, fault line zone right well it'll set up ferries and you may sit for uh, 10 to 12 hours waiting for a ferry ride that takes another 8 or 10 hours to get across this water right in fact the, the one that I recall and this was so vivid I could smell the seawater and remember how long I was on the ferry on this standing vision it was 5 hours to cross. That, that would be consistent with my reality. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't know when it is. When people say, "Oh, Deagle, we are sending a date," I don't have any dates. I can just tell you when you have a vision that's that vivid, just like the one that I had a standing vision about Tehran. They've get greenlighted. Both Obama and Romney have greenlighted an attack on Iran. Uh, militarily, they can't control the ground. John, what's going to happen if they try to do an air attack? And, of course, we have these rockets uh, systems all over Tehran and all over Iran. It's one-third the size of the United States, half of it's mountainous. A lot of them are false missile silo sites. Their uh, nuclear facilities are so deep, even our best bunker buster bombs can't get them. And well, there's no be, way... They'll stir up yeah. a harness nest, and uh, the Muslim uh, nations will probably unify as one to meet this threat. Exactly. In other words, the ancient Muslims, uh, Arab saying, long before Islam, long before even Jesus Christ and Muhammad, is me and my brother against my cousin, me and my cousin against my enemy. And if you want to unify them, just do something like this and see what happens. Absolutely. Crazy well, things are happening. So, so yes, we're journalistically following this. It's not disinformation. We are trying to dig through as much as we can. All we can tell you is if you aren't prepared now with food, water, self-protection, and electricity, if you're not ready for major events happening, including Fukushima, the Reactor 4 blowing, mid New Madrid system, I'm not going to say God help you because he sold us to tell you to get ready.